come to the right spot. It's another edition of Lewis at Large. 60 minutes of Smart Talk Radio is in your future with guests from all walks of life and all points of view. And now with this week's edition of Lewis at Large, here's your host, Warner Lewis. Welcome, everybody, to this segment of Lewis at Large. Uh, again, yours truly, Warner Lewis, right here from the old flight deck. And uh, Smart Talk Radio continuing for sure here. We're going to be talking to Dr. Deb Hershorn, uh, affectionately known and well-known as Dr. Deb. She is a Ph.D. and marriage counselor, family therapist as well. She specializes in domestic violence, of which we will talk about a little bit during this segment. But uh, just as importantly, we'll talk about just sort of the state of America's mental health. Uh, she does have some concerns uh, about the mental health community and some of the things that they're doing, but uh, should be an interesting one indeed. Dr. Deb, uh, how are you, my friend? I am wonderful. How are you? Well, I think I think we're good. Uh, let's do this. Let's give our audience uh, a little bit more depth about you. Uh, you are a, a marriage and family therapist. That, that feels a little bit broad. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your background. See, marriage and family therapy, it's really not any more broad than psychology. It's just that it includes more people. You kind of got to squeeze more folks into the tent. But really, that is how human beings are. We're connected. We relate to one another. We're affected by one another. And so you don't get a real handle on who a person is out of the context of who they associate with and who their environment is. And just to kind of bring it into the current conversation, if you take a look at the killers who have been unfortunately doing mass murders in the last five years, ten years, so on, you find that they should not be looked at alone. They should be looked at in the context of what was affecting them, what propelled them to do what they were doing whether it's their family background or, in one case or another, schools they were attending. So I'm a systemic thinker. I look at the whole system. That's what marriage and family therapy really means. One of the uh, the other thing we wanted to talk about, too, you have a new workout called The Healing is Mutual, which we will touch on. But just uh, from where you sit, uh, your years of experience overall, uh, a being uh, great shape, F being a disaster, grade the current sort of mental health uh, of Americans right now. I, yeah, I, I don't like that kind of a, 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 a all in one bucket kind of answer <laughs> okay. that I would have to give you um, because you know what? I, people have always had very strong members. The country has always had members that needed help. And I think that's from time immemorial. We've come through a lot, and we've come through it beautifully. I'm, I tend to be a little optimistic about people. I think that, as an example, Hurricane Sandy, which devastated my community, my own house and my community around me, and the wonderful warm love that the community poured out for one another is just fantastic. So, you know, it depends where you're looking. If you're, if you're a crime scene investigator, you might see life as being really difficult and full of problems and people not so good. But you have to look at the big picture. So I'm sorry if I'm not giving you a real No, you're, that's answer. fine. That, that, uh, we would not expect you to have too sweeping of an answer. Let's, uh, let's dial back. Uh, let's just go back a, a decade or so. And, and as you said, come through a lot of things. Let's – the – psychological and 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 political and social implications of an event like 9-11 uh the unique economic crisis that we have all been through over the last several years uh layered on top of that what what feels like a proliferation of multiple crimes mass murders etc uh all lend itself to what would be a very sort of stressful social and political environment, but uh, you feel we've come through pretty well. Well, let's put it this way. More can be done, and that's really my mission. And, yes, I think this is a great country. I think it's a great world. That's where, who I am. I'm glad to be part of it. Obviously, people who kill themselves in the process of killing others 
don't feel that way. And those are the people I want to help. And I feel our country is not doing enough for those people. Partially because look at look at the innocent people that get taken down in the process. But the truth is, if those people were helped, they might have been productive members of society instead. So I think that's what we need to focus on. That's that's my mission. Is there anything in common with uh, the events in Colorado, the events in Wisconsin, et cetera, that you see with those that were alleged to have perpetrated all of these crimes? Uh, and, and what do you see that is in common? What's in common is the people were unhappy. They were loners. They didn't have someone to talk to. Some of them were seeing a psychiatrist, and you would think, oh, well, they had someone to talk to. Not true. What they do is the psychiatrist is, as a human being, disempowered by the messages that he or she has received in school, and they think that they cannot help this person but rather must push some medication on the person to help, and that has failed. That is not the solution because medication, as Thomas says, who wrote many years ago, the myth of mental illness said beautifully and others have said, you can't fix a person's attitudes, values, opinions, and even deepest feelings with a pill. You just can't. A pill is not the solution. The solution is is family therapy and starting at a very early age, which none of these people received, none. If you're joining us, we are talking to Dr. Deb Hershorn, known as Dr. Deb. Uh, she is a marriage and family therapist specializing in domestic violence, also the author of a new work called The Healing is Mutual. Uh, Dr. Deb, uh, what about those that say, you know, We've had people that have been troubled, that have been uh, lived on the edge uh, of what would be considered mainstream society since the founding of the country. Their solution was not necessarily taking out several of their fellow citizens. Um, where, how do you answer that, and, and what's different in 2013 than was maybe back in 1945? I don't think anything is different. If you look in the Bible, Cain killed Abel. I mean, I think that this is human nature. It's built into us. The method may change. The number of people hurt may change. That's true. But me, personally, i rather look at the person who did this and try to heal that person when he's five years old. Why should a small child, Adam Lanza, was noticed at five as having problems? And when he was in middle school, the security guards, you can look this up, the security guards were telling one another to keep an eye out for him. Why wasn't he given family therapy? Why? This would have empowered his parents. They would have had tools to help him and help themselves. And that didn't happen. It didn't happen. That is what needed to happen. So whether you go back 100 years or to the founding of, of the human race, it doesn't matter. We need to reach out and help each other. And that's what's missing. How about, uh, maybe you've already answered it, but uh, from, where, again, where you stand, how good, how well equipped are our schools, as an, and it's not just their responsibility, obviously, but how, from the school point of view, how equipped are they uh, to recognize issues like this and how responsive uh, they, and what, what kind of resources do they have? See, they have the tools, the resources, and everything that they need already. The counselors are very well trained. I don't know why they have not actually believed in themselves enough to take the initiative. What they should have done with Adam Lanza at five and all these people is pick up a phone and say, hey, mom and dad, come in and talk to me, please, and bring, we'll bring little Adam in too, and we'll have a nice chat and see what we could do to help this little boy. That's what's missing. 
it, it has to be done in a gracious way, in a loving way, not in a way that sounds blaming or criticizing of the parents. That's foolish. But it's simply how they do it, not actually their abilities. They can do that. They have the tools. They can do a little family therapy. And every single university has family therapy programs where the school can, the university can send out to the local community. I know at Nova Southeastern University where I was trained, that was done where the professors work with the local community schools to train the counselors and teachers to look out for these things and to learn a few little skills to reach out to the families. It's so simple. They have their their talents already as counselors. What about, uh, I've asked this of other uh, therapists and, and sociologists, uh, we see what is happening in America. Uh, are we wrong to assume it's not happening at the same level in other countries? Because if it is, we don't seem to hear about it. Of course it's happening in other countries, and, and there were so many problems, uh, for example, not to, not to single out one, but China had uh, school shootings within the last 12 months, too. Um, that, that crazy guy in Sweden, it's happening all over. It's happening all over. There isn't a country that's safe from it. And I might add that the terrorists who train young children to become jihadists are doing the same thing. It's, it's a mental illness, and that's what we have to understand. And it needs to be addressed when children are young. What, uh, again, if it was up to you, uh, we can address it when they're young. So you're saying it's a combination of parental uh, observation. It's an observation of those in the school system. Uh, Any place else you see where things break down? Well, the point is the responsibility ultimately is the parents, but it should be in the schools, the churches, the community centers, after-school activities, any place where children are going to congregate, those people who are in charge should keep their eye out and do. They see when a child is not behaving the way you would expect, but they're not taking the initiative to reach out to the families to get them help. That's what's missing. Well, let's talk, uh, just because the time is limited here, let's talk about uh, this new work, The Healing is Mutual. Give us the premise and uh, give us some setup. Okay. As I said before, I look at the family as a system. It, to raise healthy children, you need a healthy couple bond. So I want to create that for people. I truly believe that divorce is worse than what it's supposed to be fixing. People go into a divorce with resentments, and they never get past those resentments because the problems that were created in the marriage where they felt betrayed, they felt hurt, they felt that the promises that they expected to be delivered were not, they never have a chance for that to be fixed because once you've divorced, that's it, you're done. So they'll be in the system in court for years and sometimes decades fighting with each other. Why are they fighting so long? They're fighting because the emotional problem was never going to be resolved and it can't be resolved in court. So my premise is if your marriage is in deep trouble, fix it. And how do you fix it? You can't fix it by pointing fingers. Who's to blame? You've got to fix it by healing. That's why the book's called The Healing is Mutual, and you've got to fix it together. That's why it's called Mutual. Even when there's been emotional abuse, physical abuse, harsh language, uh, estrangement, you've got to work together to fix it. And it can be done. And not only done to where you've got a healthy relationship, but a happy one, a passionate one. You can be in love again. That's my premise. What about the, uh, it's certainly being addressed by Hollywood, whether it's Silver Linings or the recent movie Hope Springs with uh, Tommy Lee Jones uh, and Meryl Streep. I'm curious as to, that almost seems... uh, uh, 
uh, indicative of what's happening right now, particularly probably at the baby boom level? Yeah, definitely. It's possible to make things better and good if we only accept each other as human and recognize that we have flaws, go easy on each other, don't glom on to the flaws. That's one of the points in my book. Look for the good. Search for the good in your partner. And look for it carefully and tell yourself over and over what is good about your partner. Don't allow the flaws to trip you up every time you say good morning. Dr. Deb, as you, uh, as you do a lot of this uh, marriage counseling, I'm, I'm curious, are you seeing more and more people uh, going the route of, of trying to fix things or uh, because we know certainly over the last couple decades the divorce rate has skyrocketed. Right. Uh, unfortunately, that's my uh, little challenge there. I've, people just take what they think is the easy way out and it's short-sighted because it's sending a message to their children that when things don't work out, quit. It's sending a message that people are not just human, but people somehow should be terrific. That's why second marriages end in divorce as well. People think that there's a perfect person out there for them, and they get married the second time, and my gosh, that person wasn't perfect at all. So they go through that divorce again. What they really need to do is stop looking for perfection, because none of us is perfect, myself included. But we have to really accept each other and let go of the small things and focus on the good things. Work on being kind. I know that sounds pat. The book is 200-some-odd pages. It's not pat. I break everything down and give many, many tools for accomplishing these goals. So I don't know if that's answering your question. No, I think it it does, and I've, I've wondered. I think a lot of baby boomers have wondered, as you look to the gen x and or gen y rather the sort of the uh, baby boomer kids uh we're curious i'm sure as to what their solutions will be having seen a generation of divorce yeah well i think they're going to be marrying and the, and the trend shows they're marrying later on because they're afraid of marriage they're afraid it's not going to work and it, they enter into it very gingerly they sleep together they live together that seems to work, then they get married, and then sometimes it falls apart anyway because they haven't learned the tools, which is what they really need for making it work. They only know how to get out of it, and that's not good enough. What about, uh, do you have any thoughts about the phenomena, uh, again, going to Gen Y, baby boomer kids, uh, moving back in with mom and dad uh, either after college or never really moving out in the first place? It happens. It depends on the arrangements that you have with your child or what the child has with the parents. The child should contribute to the home, and the parents should provide a nurturing home. But the main thing that the parents should have provided several decades earlier, and it's never too late to start, is giving the child a sense of responsibility and a sense of pride in who he is, that he can go out there and solve his own problems. That, that's a tool that he needs so that eventually when the economy improves, he can have a place of his own and he can start his own family. But he needs to believe in himself, which gets back to what I was saying at the very beginning of this with regard to the recent spate of shooters. You see, it's all connected. When a child doesn't have the tools, it should be noticed by counselors in the system, in the school system or community system, wherever the child is, and brought to the parent's attention, how can I help? That's what's needed, I believe. What uh, Are you finding that the... the uh the psychiatric and mental health community across the country pretty much shares your view, or do you feel like you're out there on your own? Uh, the latter, unfortunately. They want to pop the pills. The um, medical, the pharmaceutical community is a multi-billion dollar industry. For example, did you know that the major founders of the Anxiety Disorders Association of America are Pfizer, Wyeth, Solvay, Eli Lilly, Smith Klein, Beecham, Pharmacia. 
Upjohn, Glaxo, Welcome, Bristol, Myers, Squibb, etc. You see what I'm saying? It's all about the money in the pharmaceuticals propelling people to pretend that this works, even though scientific research shows that the medications don't really work. Well, let me give you an example. A policy analyst, uh, Thomas Moore, did a study, uh, it searched through the FDA files, found two identical trials of the antidepressant Serzone. Okay. One showed a marginally positive result, and the other showed no measurable effect. And guess what? The marginally positive result was published and the other wasn't published. So people think, oh, Serzone's a great antidepressant. Well, guess what? There's no rule that requires pharmaceutical companies to publish negative results. Now, one good thing that has happened recently in the last five or so years is that the American, um, the New England Journal of Medicine and the um, Journal of the American Medical Association are requiring whoever writes an article on drug trials to disclose their funding sources. That's a good thing. Because as soon as they did that, an awful lot of this stuff did stop. And the publication of things that were outrageously good, which really weren't so good, stopped. Because you have a bias when you're paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to do your study. So we are learning little by little, but I am feeling like David and Goliath. But I'll just keep on, you know. Well, Dr. Deb, uh, as we start to kind of wind down here, uh, if our listeners uh, feel that they have a marriage issue or a marriage that is in in jeopardy in some way, shape, or form, or they feel they have a child or any loved one, for that matter, that is at risk uh, on a wide variety of issues, what's the first thing they should be doing? They should definitely look and find a family therapist preferably one that they can see face-to-face. If they can find someone that they feel comfortable with, who understands them, there are family therapists, I do it, who will work long distance on Skype, for example. And if they don't feel comfortable with that, they should at least buy self-help books. I don't appreciate people knocking those. They are helpful. Any one nugget of an idea is worth it if you can take it and use it well. So they, they have to not think, oh, dear, this is just terrible. They have to start thinking positive. How can I fix this problem? Well, the work is the healing is mutual. She is Dr. Deb Hershorn. She is a family therapist specializing in marriage and family therapy issues, uh, also including domestic violence. Uh, Dr. Deb, how can people find out more? Uh, about the work you do, maybe some solutions, and also about the book? Well, one thing they can do is go to my website, drdeb.com, D-R-D-E-B, and they can see the book there. There are three versions. There's a whole home study course, which has audio and, and workbooks. There's the book. There's also the e-book. The book is available on Amazon, but you can start at my website, and it'll click you over to the spot where it's sold. Um, they can um, also just, you know, read my blog. If they want to get more information, they can text their email and their name to 516-628-6077, and they'll get a free ebook there, not this book, but a little book that I wrote to kind of get them started. So there are options for them. Whether they choose to work with me or anybody else, there are lots of wonderful people out there, but they do need to take that step. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Good luck with the book and do appreciate your insights. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. 